Let's make VVVV Classic, the mighty World Cities patch. A three-dimensional visualization of the world's most populated cities, the higher the individual population count, the longer the lines grow out of the surface of this invisible globe. And the data in question is loaded into VVVV straight from a CSV file, which you also need to download if you want to patch along. So make sure to pause the video, get the file from the link in the video description and then open your new VL document once you're all set. The first step when visualizing data would always be to check out what the data actually looks like. So if you open the CSV file you just downloaded, you will see a list with around 26,000 rows, one for each city, and several columns for different properties like the name of the city, which country it belongs to, and also the latitude and longitude specified as floats in degrees, as well a number representing the population going up to almost 38 million. These are the things that we will be interested in later, so let's just keep in mind for now that latitude, longitude and population count are stored in columns 2, 3 and 9. There are two more things to note at this point. First, you can see that the CSV also has a headline with the title of the properties. So, as we are actually interested in the rows that contain the data of the cities, we later will have to filter that headline row out of our dataset. And lastly, you might notice that the population can have values that are corrupted. Sometimes it contains a value like primary, and sometimes it is just zero, which does not make sense. When working with data sources, you will probably always be confronted with such corner cases. And also in our application, we will have to deal with these. In order to get the data into your project, you need to make sure to close the application you're viewing the data with, because VVVV cannot access the file otherwise. We will then use the file reader node, but take care to pick the string version because we want the content of the file as a text. So expose the output and the path input, right click on the path IO box, select the CSV file and then trigger the read input with a bang. You should immediately see the content inside the IO box. We can now start parsing this data, so we have all the relevant information in place for our visualization. Our goal will be to convert the string into two spreads, of which one contains the latitude and longitude of the city as a 2D vector ranging between 0 and 1, and the other should contain the population count. Let's start by using a split to lines node to convert the whole string into a spread of strings wherever a line break is detected and then, as mentioned before, immediately get rid of the headline using the skip node from the spread category with an input of 1, as we only want to skip the first entry in the spread. You can see that the resulting spread now contains a number of 26,569 entries, and this is a number to worry about. VVVV by default executes everything in a patch 60 times per second, and parsing each of these entries that often can slow down your CPU immensely especially when you are on a weaker machine. During this tutorial, I will introduce you to some strategies to tackle performance issues, and just to make sure we are not running into these right from the beginning, we will use a split add node to start developing with just a test set of entries. So let's set it to 500 for now. We will later increase this number once we have some optimizations in place. In order to extract the relevant information, we have to loop over the spread and split the slices by a semicolon, which is the character that separates the row into individual columns. And this again returns a spread of which we can now get the slices with the index numbers 2, 3 and 9 as noted earlier. Still, we're getting strings as results, so we need to convert them into something numeric using try parse. And this node is adaptive, so it will only work when the output is sent to a sync that is typed to something specific. For instance, two floats for latitude and longitude, and another one for the population. Finally, we also want to combine these two latitude and longitude floats into a vector 2 and send it through a map node, with which we map the number to a range between 0 and 1. We can finally leave the for each by creating two splicer outputs, and if you expose them you can see that we successfully have created two spreads containing vectors for the positions and floats for the populations.
Coming back to the initial problem we already discovered when checking the CSV file, we should now make sure to only include those entries that have a valid population count. And this can be done very easily in the for each by creating a key pin and sending in the output of a condition that returns true whenever the population is above zero. Obviously, in our test set, we had 10 invalid entries as the output of the loop now only returns 490 entries. But like this, we can be sure that we keep on working with a clean data set. After all this heavy lifting, we need to take care of the fact that some things in the patch are already taking up some bigger amounts of computing power. You can always check the performance of patches by hovering over the nodes and regions to see how much time they take to evaluate. For instance, if you check the file reader node, you see that it executes way faster than, for example, split to lines or the whole for each region. And this is due to the fact that the file reader already does some performance optimizations under the hood, which we can also do by using cache regions. Let's refactor our patch a bit beforehand and paste everything except the file reader into a node called parse data. You can simply create it from the node browser after typing in the name by clicking on the node entry. In your created node, you also need to make sure to create an input pin for the incoming data string, another one for the index of the split add node, also create two outputs for the spreads and connect everything again in your document. If you now hover over the node, you can see the accumulated timing of everything that is inside of it. What we want to do is to decrease this number by selecting everything in the node except the inputs and outputs and surrounding it with a cache region via the context menu. Cache regions basically make sure that everything inside of them is not constantly evaluated in VVVV's main loop, but only when they are either forced on the input pin or when a value changes that is connected through a border control point. The result of the evaluation is then stored on the border control point at the bottom of the region. Surrounding something with a cache region won't create these points automatically, therefore you need to create these connections yourself. So once the region and the border control points are in place, you can see that the node behaves exactly like before when changing the index value, but its effect on the performance on your patch when nothing changes is close to zero. We have come to a point at which it makes sense to reference VLStrite, as we will finally start rendering the visualization. Create a scene window and a root scene and also we need some kind of a light, for example a directional light. Our base primitive will be a cylinder, of which we set the anchor point to bottom, because later we will only scale it into one direction and not into both. We will use the parse data to transform instances of the cylinder, so let's set up the instancing pipeline by using a from value node to create a spread of entity components and an instancing spread component node in which we will send the transformations generated from the data. The first step will be the individual rotation of the cylinders based on the latitude and longitude of the cities. Right now, this looks rather odd as the cylinder initially is scaled bigger than we need it to be and also the primitive itself is pointing upwards although we need it to point sideways. So let us correct these two things by setting the X and Z scaling very low. as well as applying another rotation of 0.25 around the x-axis to every cylinder. And maybe you can already guess that we will later use this float for the scaling based on the populations. The final step is inserting a 3D translate between both rotations and if you slowly increase the Z component, then you can see that we are translating the cylinder away from the center of the sphere. Now that we have successfully translated and rotated the cylinders, we also want to scale them based on the population count. So let's also send this spread into the for each by creating another splicer. You might try to connect it to the scaling and although it looks really cool, it is not exactly what we want. 
Like this, the cylinders basically stretch into infinity and we need to scale the values to something meaningful. So let's also insert a map into this link and set the input maximum value to the highest number the spread contains using a max node. If you then increase the output maximum value, you can see that the cylinders are getting longer depending on the value for the population. If you now increase the index at which the dataset is split, this visualization will start to make more sense as you will see more clearly the coastlines and continents. Maybe you will also recognize some bigger cities in here. But again, we will need to take care of our computer's performance because although we are instancing the cylinders, we are still calculating the individual transformations 60 times a second. If you hit F2 in your window, this little view will tell you at which point your performance starts to decrease. In my case, I can go up to something like 15,000 cities until my frame rate drops, but maybe you're patching on a weaker machine, so watch out not to go too high with this value yet, as we need to repeat the same refactoring and caching steps that we did before. So let's cut everything over here and paste it into a new node that we call render cities. Surround everything with a cache region and then by passing the links through border control points, create all the input and output pins for the node. Make sure you're naming them properly, like the entity output of the cylinder, positions for the latitude and longitude, populations which you also need to send into the max node, and finally the input to control the Z translation from the outside. Once you connect the node again in your application, you might need to change the index value one time so the cache re-evaluates the transformations. And at this point, as we properly have cached and instanced everything in our document, you should be able to visualize the whole dataset by increasing the index to the maximum amount of entries. Finally, we will apply some eye candy to the visualization, first by creating a skybox light and surrounding the whole scene with a gradient texture. The node to create this texture from is stored in the package VL Stride Texture Effects. Then navigate to Stride Texture Source, select Gradient and send its output into the cube map. On the skybox light, we will increase the intensity of the light and I would also like to provide colors for the gradient that I generate from hex codes, but of course you're also free to pick any color that suits you. And as a final touch to our scene, we will use a post effect called Bloom that we need to send through a post effects node and increase its intensity input until you get the final visualization of the world's population made in VVVV. Thank you very much for watching. In case you have any questions or problems, let us know in the comments and until then, have a good patch.